Yeah, I mean, obviously this job, it it kind of fell onto my lap initially. Like it just, it just happened. And then all of a sudden I was living in Europe and I didn't have the appreciation for what I had. I didn't truly understand, yeah, the situation I was in. This podcast is brought to you by Trivelo Coaching, where we help triathletes and cyclists like you train smarter to race faster. I'm your host, Jordan Donnelly, and on my left is former Australian Ironman champion and head coach of Trivelo Coaching, Jared Donnelly. Today's episode is a extremely special story, and we say that a lot on this podcast, and that's because we're lucky enough and we're very grateful to get to interview and speak to um, some very special athletes and very special humans with incredible stories. But unfortunately, this story doesn't have a happy ending yet, and we want that to change. And the story of Jimmy Whelan as an athlete and as a professional cyclist is absolutely one you want to hear. He was picked up very quickly when he was very new to cycling after being a very talented runner. Um, by EF Education and spent three years in a professional contract before losing his contract after having a, um, a poor year with no racing uh, results uh, due to two horrific crashes where he was put out for a lot of the year. And unfortunately, that's the, the cruel nature of the sport is uh, even though he was crashed and injured, he didn't get a chance to keep proving himself and so lost his contract. But his motivation for being a professional cyclist and making that his life and making that his profession and his job has not waned. He spent the last couple of years doing everything in his power to keep training like a professional athlete uh, to get himself back onto a world tour team, but it hasn't happened yet. And he has some incredible results to his name, which started with winning the under 23 Tour of Flanders, his first European racing win, which actually got him his professional contract, as well as his best result being second at the Australian Road Nationals in 2022 last year, first at the Santos Festival of Cycling, which was a Tour Down Under event that happened in the COVID year in 2022, as well as an incredible performance in this year's uh, National Road Race, where he was a standout performer and one of the strongest riders on the day, where he was really trying to show his cards of why he should be picked up by a pro team. And this episode was... Uh, quite tough on Jimmy, to be honest. We, he really let us uh, kind of ask him some pretty hard questions about his situation and his story is awesome. Hearing about his training is awesome. He's currently living in Andorra. Um, it's so cool to always hear about what specific training sessions athletes are doing, how they're approaching heat acclimatization and altitude acclimatization. But the key to his story is the fact that he is doing everything in his power to get a job again uh, and he's doing it all unemployed, earning no money, training like a professional cyclist, trying to make it back in. And dad, um, you just said to me before we started recording this intro um, how hard it would be to sit there and have to answer questions about how hard his situation is, uh, yet, yet he opened up fully and it's truly a motivating story. Wow, George, yeah. Um, it, it's uh, one of the, the better podcasts that we've ever had and uh, why is that? Well, I've never had someone so openly be vulnerable um, because that's the situation he's in. He He's basically unemployed. He wants to be a, a professional bike rider and he has been a professional bike rider, but he's in a, in limbo. And and it's a really hard situation because he has no way of proving himself again because unless you go to a bike race and win it, then no one's going to see or hear from you ever again. So, so this is a really hard situation to be in. And and the the good thing is his mindset is in fantastic condition. Um, he's also a very talented bike rider. Anybody who can win the Tour of Flanders and win the Australian Under Twenty Three Road Title and come second in the Open National Road Title has talent, and that's not in dispute here. We we know he's talented. He's super talented. Um, what is the problem is that it's just circumstances have prevailed against him to to actually be able to do the thing he loves the most, which is ride his bike um, in a competitive situation. He loves riding his bike full stop, but he loves also racing his bike. And this is a story of a guy, and we had a really great interview with Lockie Morton not long ago, um, ironically from the same EF education team. And um, and they're two vastly different stories. Um, and And Jimmy wants to be a professional competitive racer. Um, and he, he knows the, the why he's doing it and the and the reasons why he's sticking it out when he doesn't have a contract. He's still training his backside off to make sure that if an opportunity arises, he'll be ready and able to slot straight into any race that any sports director or world tour team um, has available to him. So it's a, an example of resilience. It's an example of 
um, vulnerability. It's an example of consistency. It's an example of persistence. He's showing all these characteristics that that I would love to have um, if I was, you know, going into the trenches, as they say, um, against the opposition. Um, he has these in spades and he has the talent. So I'm hoping it's only a matter of time before um, things open up for him and he ends up getting uh, the contract that he so so desperately wants and so he can, you know, spend the next five, ten years being the professional bike rider that he wants to be. And I now know he appreciates um, everything he had before and as we've said many times you know you only you only appreciate things once it's taken away from you and and that could not be more obvious in this situation and and he's not um, a sad sack uh, looking for sympathy that's not what he's doing he's just so determined to put himself out there to uh, to get an opportunity again to, to do the thing that he loves and I hope everybody enjoys this because it was one of the better podcasts that we've ever done. The similarities between uh, him and Lockie Morton are, are striking, even though it's kind of two different situations where Lockie was trying to get away from road cycling a little bit and um, Jimmy's trying to get into road cycling, but their mindsets are so similar in that they're, they're both trying to do what they love uh, and absolutely love that about it. So it's hard to articulate um, exactly why this story is so motivating and so captivating. Um, we'll just have to let you listen to the episode and really take in everything you're saying. It's another long one. Uh, but it's worth every second and so and I'm sure once you hear it you'll feel the same way about Jimmy and you'll be just as big fans as we are and uh, you'll be screaming his name to everyone uh, to, to back him and back another Australian cyclist to to get on the world tour circuit so without further ado here is the episode with Jimmy Whelan. Jimmy Whelan thank you so much for jumping onto the podcast big welcome to you uh, the first question we like to ask is what training session did you do today well it's so it's 6 p.m for you guys it's 8 a.m for <laughs> for me so the only session i've done is i've had a shower and i've gotten out of bed um yeah so i did know that i was on autopilot give us the, give us the session for the last 24 hours <laughs> yeah i mean yesterday i did five and a half hours uh, i'm in andorra at the moment so i did five and a half hours of uh hilly high zone two climbing um, nothing crazy, but up here at the altitude, it's uh, five and a half hours at any zone is is challenging. So, yeah, five and a half hours yesterday, uh, did the sauna in the afternoon, and then I have a rest day today. So just an easy two hours. What's the uh, elevation that you're living at? So I'm currently at 1,998 metres, which is <laughs> a bit dis- disappointing. I wish I was another two metres up the hill, but... Um, yeah, uh, I'm at more or less 2,000 meters, um, and yeah, it's a it's a good place to train. It's beautiful. I'm um, in the Pyrenees here. Uh, yeah. So we want to dive into your background and and how you've gotten here because your journey as a cyclist has been a little bit different. You came into cycling quite late, and you had some rapid progression, but you were a runner before that, and we're really interested in that side of things because most runners uh, get on the bike and absolutely hate it and they're no good at it. So tell us a little bit about your uh, background as a runner first and how that developed into uh, you becoming a professional cyclist. Yeah. uh, As you said, I was a runner um, through my school years. So uh, it was kind of my identity throughout school, Uh, throughout primary school. I played uh, soccer and football and all all the other sports. And then throughout high school, I kind of did running more or less full time. Um, And yeah, I, my my favorite event was probably the fifteen hundred. Um, uh, the peak of my athletic career probably came at about the Zadapec under twenty three thousand meters, um, which I'm sure probably some of the listeners would know. Um, and yeah, I finished fourth in that event. Um, I think I ran eight sixteen for the three k. Um, yeah, and. Uh, yeah, I was a runner th- still until the first year of uni and then I went across onto the bike um, following a, a bit of an injury and, um, yeah, I thought it was the end of the world at the time that my running career was coming to an end, but it turned out it was uh, a bit of a blessing in disguise. So, yeah, now I'm a full-time cyclist. What was the injury that uh, that dragged you off the track and onto the bike? Yeah, so I 2015 New Year's, um up in falls creek i basically uh trained too much and didn't recover enough and then went straight down to a track session down in melbourne and um tore a bit of my achilles um and 
it wasn't uh, it definitely wasn't a career ending uh, injury, uh, but at the time it was just really difficult to put days together. Um, and yeah, uh, I then went across onto the bike for some cross training, and then I actually really enjoyed riding. And I thought, well, uh, yeah, why not give it a go? Um, I was struggling with injuries before that too, so. I was just really having a bad run with running and, and you know what running is like, it's savage. It's uh, I was getting all these small niggles and I just couldn't put the train together to become the athlete I wanted to be. Um, yeah. Is is that a bit contrasting now? Because on the bike, you really can train a lot more than you can as a runner and I'm being quite general generalizing here. But if you train like you do as a bike rider and you are a runner, the risk is so much greater of breaking down and actually not being able to maintain that consistency, which is, I think, what you love so much about the bike compared to, I mean, you still obviously would love to be able to run, I imagine, but is that is that something that you, you would see straight away, the difference between the two? Yeah, it's a huge difference in the training. Um, like a pretty standard ride now is five hours for me and that's just, it almost feels like a maintenance day in a way. Um, so... Yeah, I, I definitely do miss that about running, that uh, it was a lot more time efficient. Um, but yeah, it is it is something that uh, I'm lucky to have all day, every day to still train. So riding my bike and doing pro hours is is a luxury. And it's, and it's an amazing thing about cycling is that you can do, yeah, five hours, 25, 30 hour week back to back. And uh, yeah, I, my Achilles is still fine. So this is nice. Yeah. <laughs> How long was that time frame between once you started riding as a bit of cross training to the point where you were basically riding full time and deciding to give cycling a big crack? Yeah. Uh, so at the end of 2015 and to the start of 2016, I kind of had a year where I was trying to quote unquote f find myself, I guess. Um, I went to Europe with a mate for three months um, where I definitely was not a professional athlete in any way. Um, <laughs> And I came back from Europe and I, I, I wanted to sort myself out a bit. I didn't quite feel myself. So um, that's when I started to, to cross train um, on the bike. Uh, and then, yeah, basically the start of 2016, uh, I rode 20 plus hours a week uh, for the whole year um, and then raced domestically in 2017 um, and then raced over, started racing overseas in 2018. So it was a really fast progression, um, crazy fast actually. Uh, yeah. Take take us back to when you when you hung up the spikes and 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 thought that uh, I'm going to give the cross training a little bit of a go. Was there a point where you were going to go back to running once the Achilles had healed and you you just you had enough of the bike and and running was going to be your thing or what? How, how did that change? What happened? Yeah, I mean. Uh, yeah, as I said, 2015, I wasn't trying to be an athlete in any way. Um, I didn't really have ambitions to be either a runner or a cyclist, but then that changed in 2016. Um, and I was still putting together 20-hour weeks on the bike and I was also still running a lot. So I didn't really know what I was doing. I was, yeah, doing 20-plus hours on the bike and then still running 70, 80 Ks a week. Um, and, yeah, I, I was that was probably the closest I was to a triathlete. Uh, <laughs> Um, yeah, that's gonna happen. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I've never really given a proper try. Um, but that, that's that's a question I can ask, answer later in my life, maybe. Um, yeah, never say but, never. Uh, I basically realized that I could make something of cycling when I was doing the criteriums in Melbourne. Um, I'm sure you guys know of the Hawthorne Criterium and the Glenvale Criterium. And then I started doing the the group rides the North Road Ride in the morning, Wednesday morning long. Um, you guys in Melbourne, so I guess you kind of know this lingo. Um, yep. And that's when I really fell in love with the bike. And, uh, yeah, it was a completely different sport to running. Um, I really missed my my running friends uh, and I missed doing fast K reps around the track. But other than that, um, yeah, I, I had a strong passion for cycling and that's when I just said, okay, Start of 2016, let's go all in. And then I guess my first big result was um, the under 23 nationals in 2017. And then and then the following year, uh, no, a few months later after that, um, 
yeah, uh, winning my first European bike race, which then accelerated uh, my development process. And two weeks later, I had a pro contract with EF Pro Cycling. Um, yeah, let's not let's not skim over the first European race you won. It's one of the one of the big races, and um, just just take us through that. And and obviously, it's coming up in two weeks' time. That exact race. Um, for those who who don't know, the Tour of Flanders obviously is is one of the big the big um, spring classic races, and and you've won the under twenty three version of that. Um, how how special was that? And how 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 did uh, it's changed your life? Clearly, that that victory. So take us through that. Yeah, at the time um, when I won that race, I had no idea that what it meant. Um, I was still so new to the sport that I, I was obviously really fit and still training hard and, and was really ambitious. But I didn't realize that winning that race would give me a professional contract and change my life so much. Um, so, yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, I did the Australian Nationals and then was able to make the selection for the Australian team. Um, and I actually copped a, a bit of criticism from uh, a few of my uh, cycling mates and also the cycling team at the time because I decided to do that race instead of doing the tour of Thailand with the team. Um, uh, in, in theory, I'm a climber and I was going to the tour of Flanders and uh, it was a bit of a cost to get there, etc. cetera. Um, and in the end, it was a good decision. Um, and yeah, I mean, I was uh, staying with Cyrus Monk, uh, another uh, Victorian boy who's now on Q3 6.5. We were... Uh, yeah, we flew all the way to Europe just for that one race. So we stayed uh, in Udenard, which is the start-finish location for the race, reconned it for two weeks, and then we did the bike race. Cyrus finished in the top 10, and I won it, and then we flew back to Melbourne, and my, my life would never be the same again. So, <laughs> um, What was the thought behind that decision, like not to go with the team and decide to do Flanders when you didn't know much about well, it? Well, the way, the way I looked at it is... Uh, I was really fit at the time, and so was Cyrus. And it made sense to go to an early season European bike race where perhaps all the other boys were still in the pre-season mode. And the, the weather had been really bad uh, in Europe leading up to that race. So we kind of knew that if we brought the, the fitness from the Australian summer across against a bunch of European lads, that we might actually have a chance. Um, all we need to do is study the course and we could run a drum. Um, and yeah, uh, the our uh, Drapak development team gave us a chance to take this opportunity, which we're really grateful for. Um, and yeah, it pulled, it worked out. Um, take take us through. Actually, you you won solo, and take us through how that how that panned out for you, just if you can. Yeah. So the under twenty three race um, for this year's edition was actually quite a hilly finishing circuit. So I knew that if I could get to the, the finishing circuit, which was about 45 kilometers, four laps of a circuit that had four climbs on it, um, more or less a minute and a half long, um, and which actually suits me really well at the time. I trained uh, physiologically for, these, for this type of race. Um, and yeah, I knew uh, with the nature of the under 23 racing, it, there's no real team structure that if I could get to that finishing circuit and I could attack solo, then that was my chance to try and win the bike race. And that's what happened. Um, there was maybe 50 guys coming into the circuit and there was a lot of cat and mousing, politics, all these things. Um, and yeah, I just attacked over the top of one of the bergs and um the only thing that went with me was the the camera motorbike. So, um, yeah, yeah. Do you know which burger was specifically for our spring classics enthusiasts? There was the Wolf the, the Wolfenberg uh, over the top of that one. I can't even I, I can't actually remember the exact uh, the the other three climbs, but um, yeah, the the finish was in Northern Art, So, you you would have done the Paderberg and the Koppenberg and the Quaramont. I imagine. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Uh, so it was pretty cool. It was pretty surreal just as an Aussie to be on those climbs. Uh, yeah. In a bike race. Um, I mean, at the time I, if there was any person that didn't understand the significance of that race and that, in that, out of all those guys in that race it was probably me. Um, <laughs> yeah. 
That's awesome. That's such a cool part of the story. Yeah. One one thing about your um, your rapid rise into world tour cycling is how little time you had to um, figure out figure out yourself on the bike and figure out racecraft and figure out positioning and cornering and descending uh, and especially going to a race with such crazy cobbles. How did you find going to Europe and it's it's crazy riding uh, through that terrain with such little experience? You've basically been riding for a couple of years by then. Uh, how did you find that going over there and then suddenly thrown into some absolutely intense bunch riding in some you know, crazy terrain and courses? Yeah. I mean, as I said, my progression from runner to domestic cyclist was pretty quick, let alone from domestic cyclist to world tour pro. Um, I mean, if I, if I actually look at it, it's probably one of the fastest, if not the fastest progression. Um, like I, one th- funny fact is, uh i turned uh, i got a pro contract before i ever grabbed a feed bag from the side of the road which is just bizarre um and yeah at the time i i thought it was like absolutely amazing and but i I didn't realize how unqualified i was from a technical and skill perspective and even just uh, tactical as well um uh yeah i mean learning the craft in australia uh road cycling that is is it's you can learn quite fast but the craft in europe is completely different um and it's horribly dangerous if you don't know what you're setting yourself up for and yeah um so the biggest thing is yeah just the bunch craft um and you're racing against guys where this just comes natural they've been racing since they were 10 years old and um yeah so yeah, at the time, uh, ignorance was bliss. If I had have signed that contract knowing what I w- was signing up for and what I didn't know, um, then I would have been, uh, yeah, quite uh, quite nervous about the three years coming up. But um, it was a bit of a sink or swim situation. I, I had my first pro year uh, at EF where I got over 60 race days in all different types of races and I was really able to knuckle down and learn what this European bike racing thing was. And um, yeah, I can confidently say that I understand the sport now. Um, <laughs> and, but at, but at the time I, I certainly didn't. Um, yeah. Was, uh, was there anybody who took you under their wing once you signed that contract and acted almost like a mentor? And the, the, Jonathan Vorters is, was the, the head of uh, EF at that stage. Is that correct? Yeah, exactly. So he still is the uh, the big boss at EF. Um, he runs the show there, and and yeah, they put some resources into. Uh, yeah, I mean, firstly, I don't think they realised how new I was. Um, a lot of the directors, I think, it's safe to assume that if someone's signing a world tour contract, they would assume that they'd know the basics of bike racing and etc. and just skim straight over that. But um, uh, yeah, a few of the directors in the team just quickly realized that, yeah, this guy's so new, which is exciting. Uh, uh, but also we need to teach him. Uh, and also, uh, it was also, it's also important for me because I was learning everything new and you learn habits and you create habits straight away. So it was important to create those habits in a good way. Um, yeah, because it just becomes routine then. Um, but yeah, like a, for example, the team got me a descending coach where I had one-on-one sessions, um, three sessions in Girona, uh, in Spain, uh, where I was riding around in a car park, learning the limit of the bikes. Um, my p- falling off almost, just learning the limit of the tire, um, which which was a lot more than I thought it would, and this really helped my descending, for example, um, because in Australia I'd never raced down a descent. Um, it's quite quite rare in in the Australian situation to be racing down a twelve kilometer berg with one hundred and fifty other riders. So, and if you don't know how to do it uh, in a situation like that, it's actually very dangerous. Um, uh, so yeah, we did that, and then also have my personal director, who's actually who actually lives in Melbourne over the Australian summer. Tom Southern, um, he's from the UK, from Bristol, um, and he's a director on EF and. He's been a mentor of mine and, and he really uh, was able to communicate with the team just how new I was and was able to expose this to the team and say, hey, this guy needs this, this, this. Um, and if I go to a race, he'll tell the director of that team that I'm so new. Um, and it was also important for me to communicate that with with riders within the team. Um, 
but uh yeah i mean the expectation was they realized this but they also expected me to learn pretty quick too um which i was able to do so yeah how did you feel that you went in those early days uh did you feel like you, you came up to speed very quickly and did the other riders in your team um kind of respect your ability over your lack of race experience yeah um i think a lot of riders didn't realize how new i was so as i said uh i, I just had to learn fast um and i did learn really quick so within a, a few months of racing in europe i was able to do everything that was required of me as a supporting rider um so the biggest shock was the uae tour coming across from australia and then riding in my first ever cross wind cross wind race um and there's no better example of high bunch stress in the uae tour because everyone is so close together um and for me this was the most difficult thing to relax and to just learn the craft it was when you're coming into a sprint and you need to be when yeah you have 150 guys in a in a small four by four meter space it's pretty crazy um and just having handlebars bump against you at the time that was so foreign to me but uh i had seven days to for the first few days to yeah uh be super uncomfortable and then the next few days be more comfortable and in the last few days just have it be a natural thing um so that was really good Oh, I was going to say, you're, you're really th seriously thrown in the deep end when you said sink or swing before. It was, it was the perfect analogy because you just suddenly thrown into these massive tours. You, you said you did 60 races across that first year. It must have been a whirlwind the first two years of you just learning, training, getting thrown into these situations. Uh, how do you see that period now? Is it, is it, was it just a whirlwind of you just just um, seeing how what you could do? Yeah, yeah. looking back at it, um, it's pretty – like I'm actually super impressed with how I managed it at the time. I just kind of rode the wave, um, didn't really stress, just, yeah, just, just, I just put myself in situations and see how I reacted and I reacted really well. Um, and yeah, looking back at it, um, it's crazy what I didn't know. Um, but then all you need to do is just be put in a situation, observe the people around you, copy them, and then have that be your behavior. So yeah, if you can learn from others and your attention to detail is high and you're able to uh, look at yourself critically and be aware of what you're doing, then you can learn pretty fast. Um, and that's with anything, that's bike riding or, yeah. At what point did you start to think, okay, I'm feeling a lot more comfortable, I've, I've got some ability and, and clearly they selected you on ability because you know your performance in in that one race and your and your your power numbers and we might talk about that in a minute um are you know at at elite level like the rest of the the pro peloton so you deserve to be there um at what but what point could you start to concentrate on can i now start to everything i've learned in this such a short time how can i start winning some bike races to prove myself to to the team that i'm in at what point did that start to become foremost in your mind yeah i mean i mean the that idea was was not a goal in my first year pro it was uh to to be as resilient as possible uh to be as healthy as possible and to make sure that i could go to as, as many bike races as possible and do my job um so my personal ambitions as an athlete were secondary uh and um I still wanted to do well, obviously, um, but just to do my job for another rider was an incredibly high task already. Um, and then I came into the second year uh, and obviously COVID happened, unfortunately. Um, the team uh, decided for me not to do uh, the nationals um, and to prioritize the early season European racing, which was, which was fine. Um, and yeah uh unfortunately we i didn't race until more or less august and once uh yeah once the pandemic kind of opened up again and bike racing became a thing um yeah was that was that uh one of your first races back might have been the giro is that right in 2020 yeah, yeah. exactly so i only did two races in 2020 um so i did the tour of poland uh and the giro um and 
yeah, so that's a week-long world tour stage race, uh, Tour of Poland, uh, which is one of the hardest races on the calendar, especially after everyone's been stuck indoors, everyone's rearing to race their bike. Um, and yeah, uh, then I did my first Grand Tour, which was absolutely amazing. Um, uh, I was happy with my, yeah, I mean, in my, as, as you were saying before, they, my role as a rider was evolving, so I was no longer just doing the domestic work. Um, and I started to have some personal pressure from myself and from the team to start performing. Um, and yeah, in Tour of Poland, I was looking after Nielsen Pallets for the GC uh, and I had a few strong rides where I was in the, in the break. Uh, and yeah, I was happy with the form. Finished top 20 on GC, which doesn't seem like much, but um, personally, uh, I was really proud of that result. Um, and, and it was just a reflection of me starting to piece together, obviously the technical skills and the racing craft that I had to put together in my first year, and then also the physiological demands of racing. So if you can put those two together, then you can start thinking about, uh, yeah, GC stuff. Um, and that's where I was able to gain my first selection, uh, in a grand tour at the Giro, which was the highlight of my cycling career so far. It was absolutely incredible. Anyone that knows cycling knows a top 20 result in a tour like Tour of Poland is incredible. And then obviously to this, that just uh, defines, I think, your your rapid progression. We keep using that word, but it is just extreme to go from getting a pro contract to a grand tour in that short amount of time. Talk us through the Giro. One of the, you just said one of the best experiences or the best experience of your career, um, getting to ride a grand tour, trying to put everything together. How was it? Uh, yeah, it was a really hectic three weeks. Oh, three and a half weeks. Um, it was in October, which is obviously different to the normal time of year in May. Um, so it was quite cold. Um, and yeah, just given the the fact that, yeah, COVID happened and there was no bike racing for half a year, uh, it was really intense racing. Um, and yeah, which doesn't matter if it was or if there was COVID or wasn't COVID, it was going to be intense racing regardless. But uh, the biggest question for me was to see if I could handle the fatigue and the load of back-to-back 300 TSS days um, and just to see if my body would, uh, yeah, adapt to it, adapt to it uh, or whether it would crumble and I'd get to Milan absolutely fizzed and wanting to take three months off the bike but uh my training would suggest that my resistance fatigue was super high um so i was actually excited to see if i could stay healthy without crashing all these things stay relaxed don't not get too stressed in the first week that maybe a chance to chase a stage in the second or third week was quite viable um and yeah i didn't quite have that opportunity um and yeah i still got through it our main objective well my main objective was to help out Ruben Guerrero who won the KOM jersey um, so there was a few times during that race where Ruben might uh, miss the breakaway and then uh, this would threaten him losing the the KOM jersey so I would have to chase chase the breakaway at the front uh, and yeah people weren't too happy uh, when I would do that because the race was formed and then we would open up the race again um <laughs> So, yeah, uh, that was my yeah main achievement, um, and even just just getting to Milan, to be honest, um, was an achievement mm, in itself. Just finishing, yeah. And then, uh, and then, yeah, a week after, I spent two weeks in a hotel in Australia. <laughs> <laughs> just, yeah. yeah, crazy. Um, it is, and yeah, that would have been a proud a proud experience for you. To I'm interested in in uh, what was the team's reaction at the end. You know, you were a contributor to getting the 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 KOM jersey, and 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 secondly, how how did you prepare for your body to absorb that load day after day after day? What what specific things do you think contributed you for you to be enabled to to actually get through that as your first Grand Tour? Yeah, so uh, before the Tour of Poland, which was closely followed by the Giro, I did two really big uh, altitude blocks in Andorra. So I did three weeks up at altitude and a week of rest down at sea level and then another three and a half weeks at altitude, uh, more or less averaging 30 hours a week on the bike. 
Um, I think my biggest week was 36 hours on the bike. Um, and just accumulating that fatigue uh, where I do, yeah, big four-day blocks, five, six hours, lots of climbing, uh, and essentially simulating the load of the duro and seeing if my body could handle it. And I was at altitude. Um, and so I guess from a physiological perspective, this is what I was uh, doing to my body to make sure that I could uh, try and, yeah, uh, cope with doing my first Grand Tour, which I was able to do. In those in those sessions where you, you said uh, you're doing four days and then when you were having some recovery, what was happening in those four days? Were they all similar, um, just, just trying to get out there and do four to six hours each day? Or did you have some areas where you would maybe do a 10-minute effort here or or have a little crack for 20 minutes here or there. What Take us through what that looked like. Yeah, so with my coach, uh, Nathan Brown, uh, Nate Brown, um, he's an American and, and an in-house coach at EF Pro Cycling and still is a, a coach at EF Pro Cycling. He would do personalized programs for all his athletes. So uh, the training would look different between different athletes within the team. And, and for me, what worked really well was three or four day blocks where I would have structure in there, but the structure was always at the front of the blocks. And then I would have general endurance at the back end. So I'd make sure that I'm always fresh to do the work. So I'd have, for example, uh, high torque work. So low cadence stuff, um, classic would just be six by eight minutes at 50 cadence, uh, 340 Watts, for example. Um, and maybe in between the, and the rest in between those, I'll be doing high cadence. Um, and then also some, some zone three climbing, maybe sometimes zone four getting close to threshold, but nothing really too hard. Um, it was actually, when I look back at it, it's actually quite easy training. And I think that's because the amount of load I was doing. And then also the altitude, I find that, uh, if I start doing the high, yeah, like the VO2 work and even into threshold that it starts eating into my reserves and then I actually can't adapt and absorb the work at altitude. I end up getting too fatigued. Um, so, yeah, I think that answers that. It's really, it really is awesome insight. It's the stuff we absolutely love finding out on this podcast. Um, and so, I want to keep going with that. So, there, that's an example of some of the hard days and then those back-end endurance days. Uh, how long are you going and are you really specific with what zone you're in so you're trying to stay you know below that first lactate threshold staying in zone one and two and is that is that really strict or do you have a bit of free range just to see how, you, how you're feeling on those rides give us some example of the volume and intensity there yeah yeah so the big days that would kind of round off a four three-day block it would depend on how fatigued i am as to what i was doing um he my coach would put in a few say for example three times ten minutes at uh 340 watts so nothing crazy like my threshold at the time was around 380 390 so more than manageable um but given the context uh maybe i was quite tired and maybe i could do the session but i actually wanted to prioritize my next block and i'll just do endurance so uh, a lot of time on the climbs just 250 watts uh I'll do cadence work down the climbs too, um, which is something that not many people talk about because here in Andorra, you can spend all day, every day just riding 20K an hour, 15K an hour, and then you freewheel the descents and you've actually done no work at race pace. Um, so you lose that uh, kind of zap and that kind of... Uh, yeah, I mean, you guys know what it's like when you when you're going 45k an hour. You, you need to be efficient and uh, with your form and your cadence. So, yeah, obviously you don't get that riding 15k an hour uh, up a berg. So, yeah, yeah, that's your main principle, Dad, is is not letting any athlete freewheel downhill. It's kind of your absolute go-to rule. But it is interesting um, that. A lot of the riding around the hills that you could end up just riding low gear and then if you ride too hard on a lot of the climbs, you are going to freewheel to recover. And and it's so spot on for the for all the listeners out there. It is really important to, in a six-hour ride, you could actually freewheel for, for an hour if if you ride a lot of the climbs too hard. And 
and keeping the pressure on the pedals is one of the things that you know we we're really adamant that uh, you know just stop the freewheeling as much as possible. Even if you're just rolling your legs over on a climb that you can, you're pedaling can't keep up with the the resistance, um, is that something that you did a lot of the high cadence stuff and 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 made sure that because you're in in Andorra with so much climbing that you were keeping your your legs you know a little bit fresher. Yeah, exactly. Um, and I think, uh, yeah, just from a stimulus perspective, it's good for your legs. As I was saying, like uh, riding up the climbs, you end up riding everywhere at eighty cadence. Um, and I'm a, um, which is amazing for my, for me because I'm a spinner. So I, I would do a create a night average one hundred and fifteen cadence. <laughs> I, I look like, I look like I'm on junior gears. Um, <laughs> So coming to Andorra, I actually can get old man strength going up the climbs, which is nice. Um, but I do have to do that, yeah, the, the cadence work to make sure I don't lose the zappiness, I guess. And I actually, the reason why I first tapped into this was I, when I first came up here in 2019, I rode with Rowan Dennis and he was talking about, I was just asking about his training and he's like, what do you do up here in Andorra that's different to what you do somewhere else? And then he mentioned this, that... Uh, yeah, the climbs are amazing, but uh, they can also work against you. Um, obviously, bike racing is so fast, so use the downhills uh, as a stimulus too, um, which also means you have to respect the uphills and, yeah, um, vice versa. What's your go-to cadence now on on a uh, flat course, flat road? Uh, more or less 100. Um, Still pretty yeah. high. Yeah. yeah. I want to keep asking about um, altitude because it's it's so different for how everyone responds uh, physiologically. So you're living at 2,000 meters. Um, how high are some of the climbs that you're getting to um, and what adjustments do you need to make in terms of how your body can respond because it's so easy to push it too far, as you said, and you just won't be able to recover. Um, and can you give us some examples of depending on how high you're getting um yeah what zone you're trying to stick to and that must be tough to decide because in a race you can't choose to back off <laughs> just because you're getting higher altitude the race is the race so talk us through that process for you it does get complicated when you're living at 2000 meters and yeah when you're accumulating the amount of stress that you can accumulate up here um yeah it can definitely be used to your advantage but it can also really undo your training and it can undo your season if you're not careful um so yeah, here in Andorra, I'm, I'm, as I said, I'm living at 2,000 meters. I can go, I can turn left outside my apartment and go down to Spain, which is more or less at 600 meters. So I can do the live high, train low, um, which I'm sure many people are familiar with. Um, then I can go right and keep going up to 2,500 meters, um, which then takes me down into France. Um, and again, uh, the way I feel turning right is very different to how I feel if I do a session going turning left from my apartment. And so it's just important for me to understand uh, the stresses of both. Um, and yeah, like for example, uh, if I'm training here in the summer and I've got a race coming up that's at sea level, it's going to be really hot. Um, so for example, a tour of Poland in 2020, I was going down to Spain, down to 600 meters, not because of the sea level, but also because it was hot. So I still needed to do that heat stimulus to make sure that I could cope with the heat at the race. Because if I was doing all my training up here at 2000 meters, I wouldn't be heat adapted. Um, so, and then also at sea level, you can do the, well, 600 meters in Spain, you can do the the intensity that, that's required uh, for the race. Um, yeah, I think that answers that. Kind of. I was going to say, you know, it definitely does. Um, it's it's uh, just super fascinating to hear, um, yeah, the the different responses that people have, and um, heat and altitude are still things that aren't there's the, con the science behind them isn't concrete. It's just still so much figuring out uh, what people respond to. Um, have you, especially in the Juro, did you find that uh, you were altitude altitude adapted then um, with the work you were doing? Do you think you're way more altitude adapted now after a few more years under your belt? Where do you think you sit? Yeah, I was definitely well acclimatized to the altitude. I noticed in the Giro, um, there's a few climbs where we got over 2,500 meters. And I really noticed that I people would often, it's a similar uh, feeling to bonking. If you're not acclimatized to the altitude, you, it's, 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 bizarre, it's a bizarre feeling. You get lightheaded, very, very, very similar to bonking. Um, and I wouldn't get that. Um, and 
I would often feel yeah quite fit. Uh, for example, when we we're going up with Stelvio, there were guys. We obviously you climb from I think it's seven hundred meters to twenty eight hundred meters, which is the longest climb I've rapid. ever done. Yeah. And yeah, between as soon as you get over as soon as you get over twenty two hundred meters, a lot of guys really do feel it. Um, and yeah, like uh, it's weird to see professional cyclists and some of the best climbers in the world they can't even do 220 watts um they're just trying to get up to the top of the climb to have a hot tea <laughs> um yeah but it's it is interesting with so many professional cyclists living in andorra uh some cyclists will live up high like me and some high cyclists will live down lower at a thousand meters because they just don't respond well to the altitude. It's just not a stimulus that they react well to. So uh, whilst, uh, yeah, some athletes might see it as like an absolute game changer, some athletes don't go anywhere near it. Um, so it is interesting to see just the different responses. We could keep asking you questions about your training uh, forever and we will get back to it because we're very interested in what you're doing now. Um, but a key part yeah. of your story is um, kind of getting towards the end of your contract with EF. So you spent over three years with them, but in your final year, you had two horrific crashes which put you out for a lot of the season um, and your contract didn't get renewed and that's the situation you find yourself in now which is uh, you're just really putting yourself out there and training your ass off and putting your hand out to get a World Tour contract again. But can you talk us through that part of the story and – and what happened there? And do you do you place a lot of blame on the crashes, not giving you the opportunity to train and race like you would, or, or how did that unfold? Yeah, obviously it's a massive. Uh, it was a massive disappointment not to have my contract renewed at EF at the end of my three year contract. Um, and yeah, the two crashes on my contract year certainly did not help. Um, and when that happens, you have a pretty. Uh, small results page on your contract year, which also means that it's difficult to negotiate a contract with another team. And then if other teams see that uh, Vortas isn't, uh, yeah, isn't renewing my contract, then that's an auto, auto filtering process for them that they were like, well, okay, we'll just, we'll just look at the, the 20 other Johnnies that uh, are coming through instead. Um, so that's just, the reality of professional sport if if uh for example i, I was on a good contract at ef uh and my winning the tour of flanders maybe i've said this before on a podcast and in a video that maybe he had very high expectations of me um and maybe i didn't reach, reach those expectations and so as a result uh as a product i didn't get he didn't get the money's worth out of me um so as a result he just moves on so i understand this um and yeah it's a savage industry to be a part of um it's a hard job to get a hard job to keep and and as i'm learning now it's even harder job to get back um and yeah now i'm in a situation where last year i was with team bridge lane um, where i was able to do a good aussie summer um which basically i was hoping that i'd have yeah, a good nationals, a good uh, like the Santos Festival of Cycling, which was like the Tour Down Under last year, and hopefully I get my job back. Um, and I really thought that I had done enough to maybe get that contract at a, at a pro team, but I just fell short. Um, and then I was in a similar situation again this year, the nationals hoping to win the Aussie jersey and uh, resolve my employment issues and didn't quite work out and I'm still... I've come back to Europe, I've been training and I'm just hoping that a spot opens up with teams I've spoken to. Um, yeah, so I think I've shown over the last year and a half that uh, I'm actually getting physically stronger um, and the opportunity to chase goals as an athlete in the World Tour ranks is is still there. So I'm I'm still super passionate about chasing that and yeah, I've still got the support and I've still got a bit of cash to to see it out for another few months. And uh, whether or not I'm a professional again uh, in the pro ranks um, or maybe I'm coming back to Melbourne in a year, I'm not sure. 
but I know that I'm doing everything I can. Well, let's just let's just take us through that, and uh, there's a lot to dig into there. Um, so, if if you're at the moment living in Europe and in in Andorra and training your ass off to to be ready for whatever may come your way in the next week, the next month, or the next six months. How mentally are you going about your daily routine? And this this is incredible to us to hear this story that that your motivation is that high that no matter what's going to happen next, you are determined and doing everything in your power to enable yourself to be selected and be ready to go. So how are you how are you managing your program based around you don't really know what race you're going to train for? but you just want to be as fit as you possibly can. Tell, take us through this mindset. Yeah, it's, it's from the outside in, I, it's a really difficult situation um, mentally. Uh, obviously, I'm unemployed waiting for a contract that might not never come. Um, and I have to train like a professional with professional mentality, which takes a lot of energy physically and mentally. Uh, yeah, and it's also like it's also a lot of time by yourself too. Um, so you have to get comfortable in your own space. You have to be really s- self-inspired. Is that word? I don't know. Yeah. Yep. Like it, it, the the motivation has to come from within yourself. Um, so and yeah, your self of belief has to be super high, and it also just has to become natural. Um, obviously, with all this contract stress and the disappointment I guess from that side of things uh, I thought maybe it could result in a negative relationship with the bike and as a result putting my leg over the bike in the morning would become difficult and then I wouldn't enjoy bike riding and if that was becoming the situation then I wouldn't be able to chase being a pro again because you just can't put back to back to back 25 30 hour weeks on the bike if uh if you're in a bad headspace so yeah uh i've managed to keep things really simple um to appreciate just the current life that i still have and the opportunities that could still be possible um so yeah i mean for example i'm actually my own coach at the moment um i think my situation is quite complex and I have to really strip it back and just enjoy bike riding and enjoy riding where I am. I mean, for example, a lot of people in Melbourne would have on their bucket list to come and ride in Andorra and come and ride in the Pyrenees and I'm just doing that day to day. So I have to like have that perspective on things that what I'm doing is is not normal and it's actually an absolute privilege. Even though I'm unemployed and without a contract, it's still an absolute pleasure to ride my bike here. Um, and also to still be a, a professional athlete and not have to go to the office is something that is, uh, yeah, a privilege. Um, obviously I can't do it forever. Um, yeah, uh, times will change things, but, um, yeah, as I said, I was my own coach, so I keep things really simple. So I just, uh, if I, I've, I've stripped back a lot of the high intensity work and the, a lot of the structured work and just riding to cool places. So I can ride the front remote from here. Um, I can ride with a few old teammates um, and yeah, just enjoy bike riding for what it is. Um, and I naturally, I naturally half wheel myself <laughs> so I can just ride, <laughs> which is actually really important because it ends up, it means that I'm not doing junk and it means that I'm yeah. naturally just tapping into zone two work at altitude, which is yeah. Yeah. the main stimulus anyway. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, I mean, my situation is quite unique and I think mm. I look at the the professional peloton and everyone that was in my situation in November last year without a contract there's not actually another rider that's doing what I'm doing. Um, Everyone else has uh, moved on, I guess. Um, But I I just look at the, and maybe that's a reflection of me coming in so late to the sport that I still have a lot of untapped motivation. Um, It would be a completely different story if I had been riding a bike since I was 12 and I wanted to do something different uh, to what I've been doing for the last 15 years. Um, but yeah, uh, to be honest, I've, 
yeah, I've had to ask. I've had to, as as uh, Lockie Morton was saying in in the podcast that you guys did with him a few weeks ago. Uh, I really had to ask why I was doing this, um, because uh, there's a few hard questions that you have to ask. Is it is it like an identity thing? Am I doing this because uh, it's what uh, defines myself and it's kind of my thing? Like uh, I don't want to do anything else. Uh, and if it is an identity thing, that's not why you should be doing it. Um, and so I've answered that one. Um, are you doing it because you wanted to be a paid athlete? Again, if it, if that's your sole reason, then I think you couldn't put myself in the current situation and have that being the driving force. Uh, I really just enjoy, yeah, uh, being a professional cyclist and also being a professional athlete and then living where I am um it really motivates me uh to get up in the morning and it's it, what it's what fuels the fire so that's a great answer and uh i just love your attitude and um um you know i don't know what's going to happen in the future but with an attitude like that and a mental toughness that you've got you will prevail you have you have determination you have consistency on your side and and you you have obvious talent because they wouldn't have picked you up in the first place. So they're the things that are that are in in your pocket in in your side of the court that uh, that someone will um, hopefully see very soon. Um, but yeah, we really admire and uh, think it's unbelievable what you're doing. Um, and and the way you're talking as if it's a you know it, it's not a given. You're so grateful for it, which is one of the things that we're all about in our podcast is being grateful for everything that we have the opportunity to do. And so it's a real refreshing um, thing to hear from from a person in your situation who could absolutely be bitter and twisted about the whole situation. You know, you said you had crashes and, and you couldn't perform, but you also had a whole year of COVID where you couldn't perform and no one could perform. So you've had a three-year contract where pretty much you only were able to ride in that first year so i think the unfinished business that you're talking about is you know you really feel like you're still at the start of your career and and looking at guys who are in their early 30s like a michael matthews who's you know 33 you've still got seven years of of unbelievable exciting bike riding ahead of you if if it works out that way so so it's a really great way of hearing uh, that question answered and uh, yeah we really congratulate you and and you know things will change for you if you just keep that that determination and consistency uh, you things will turn around and and no matter how, if it takes 6 months or 6 weeks something will happen i i'm i'm sure of it so that leads me to the next question is what are the things you can do f- to enable you to get yourself in front of the the right people uh like for example every rider is represented by an agent so these agents are uh, the middle person between the athlete and the managers for negotiating contracts. So these guys are uh, are really important uh, to provide contacts and to start conversations uh, with managers, uh, with directors, even with within with riders within world tour teams. So yeah, uh, like one thing I've learned about the the professional cycling space is that uh, it's like this process of getting recruited is really uh, informal and uh, all you need to do is just reach out to people um, and start conversations. People, people are aware of my situation and they, and they, if they are aware, they understand the story and they respect my, yeah, uh, my commitment to the sport and they do give a chance to hear me out. Um, But it is, a really difficult situation to resolve because it's obviously the season's well and truly underway and to add a rider onto a roster uh, is logistically difficult, financially not part of their budget um, and they would also have to give me a chance as opposed to giving a rider from their under-23 team a chance, which is their priority because that's the whole sponsorship model of the team. Um, so. Yeah, uh, as, as as I said, the, the communicating is key. So, just giving updates to world tour managers and pro tour managers of my situation, of my training, talking to the coaches within the team. Um, so, 
well, from the numbers perspective, I've spoken to about 16 teams who have all had conversations with me over the last year and a half. Um, and these are big teams, they're world tour teams, pro tour teams. Um, and my hopeful situation is that the conversations that I've kept ticking along eventually, maybe a, maybe a, uh, a lot of riders get sick or, uh, yeah, they start running a triple race program and they actually don't have enough riders to start and they do still have one or two spots available that they can open up. Um, so in, in the, the UCI has rules on different ranked teams having a maximum amount of riders. So in a world tour, you can have 30 riders. In the pro tour, you can have 26. Um, so the teams that don't have 26 or 30 riders, it means that they can all technically give me a chance. Uh, and the teams that have been interested uh, and they said that they'll come back to me if a chance changes uh, and they still have the spot available, then that's my opportunity to get my job back. Um, if you crunch the numbers on it, it's unlikely, but crazier things have happened. Um, so, yeah. It's one of the things we say on the podcast all the time is, is it's as cliche as it is, anything can happen. And you watch, you watch that many races throughout the year where just some of the most unlikely things happen. People that take chances get through. Uh, it's just awesome. So, we're, we're absolutely about that attitude. Um, does that mean mentally that uh, while you would hope that something happens as soon as possible, um, something lucky like that, are you preparing for the fact that you might have to wait till November when contract talks happen again for everyone? Um, is that your goal to try and stick it out until then? Yeah, it, it becomes a really, again, difficult situation because uh, contracts more or less by the Tour de France are starting to get uh, dialed in. Um, yeah. And if I, if I haven't been able to find a contract by then, as someone that hasn't been racing, I my chances of getting a contract gets less. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm essentially out of the game for too long, and that's that. Um, so that's my time frame, and and I'm okay with that. And there's mm-hmm. nothing I can do about that. Um, so my chance to get a contract is over the next three or four months, um, and the only thing I need to do is again communicate with the managers that have shown interest. Um, and just stay fit. That's the only noise that I need to deal with. Everything else is uh, is irrelevant. So, yeah. How how are you going to go uh, with keeping your race fitness going? Um, is there some local stuff uh, that you, in the meantime that you can keep uh, keep sort of uh, turning up to and 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 uh, getting some of that race? You know that in case something does happen, that you will be ready to go and also maybe someone sees that you've done a KOM that's, you know, like, for example, the, the Zwift riders who come out of out of uh, Zwift and get a pro contact because they've done 7.5 watts per kilo that actually is real um, and, and no one can ignore it. Is there something like that that you can put yourself in front of people? And you just want to race a local race in Barcelona, right? Yeah. Uh, I mean, there's still racing opportunity here in Catalonia. So uh, it's pretty similar to the National Road Series. Um, so in the National Road Series, uh, an individual can enter, for example. And it's it's the same here. So I actually did a race last weekend against 170 guys. There was 17 teams. Um, and it was 110k race. Uh, just... Uh, around near Barcelona and near a town called Sabade. And yeah, there's there's actually development teams or world tour teams there. Um, so yeah, I beat some of their boys. I came third, actually. Oh, third, sorry. Yep. yep. Um, I didn't I didn't win it. I would have been a, lo- yes. a lot louder on social media if I had won it. <laughs> I saw the photo on social media, yeah. Yeah. On the podium. I was wearing a 2016 Cannondale Dravac skin suit. Um <laughs> Unreal. And yeah, so there are racing opportunities that I can tap into every now and then because I also have to do that because I can't just do a three and a half month training block at altitude. Like you need to, as an athlete, you need to feed the, the, the competition. Like the, like it's, you know, I'd like to, yeah, to go fast and to get that adrenaline of racing that I kind of trained for. Um, so that's something that, I can do in the meantime. There's more or less one every fortnight. So, um, yeah, 
and it only costs 12 euro, which is ridiculous for closed roads and everything. So, yeah, yeah, um, that's brilliant. Yeah, um, your answers are truly remarkable, um, giving an insight into where you're at at the moment. And this is kind of so much to tap into mentally. I guess it must be equally frustrating to be so close to getting a contract, having you know, banging on the door and having these conversations, especially when. As you said, you you probably ticked every box possible early 2022, coming second at the Nationals. I mean, winning would have been the only better thing you could do, but um, your performances over that summer were um, as good as you could have hoped. So while that's frustrating, it must give you hope for these last few months um, that you are right there and just need something to tip you over the edge. Yeah, exactly. And it's really difficult to gauge how close I am to a contract because it really does just take one conversation within a team that I'm completely unaware of at a Tuesday meeting and then all of a sudden they call me up and I could be racing that next week. Um, and I'm on I'm on Whereabouts, which is like the anti-doping program. Um, and so I'm actually, all they need to do is to give me a kit and a bike and I'm ready to go. Um, so I've even paid for my international UCI license. I've got all the insurance ready to be paid. Uh, so I've really got all everything that I need to do, uh, and the only thing I need to do is get that get that damn phone call. Um, yeah. Now Simon Clark was in a similar position um, uh, a year ago. Yeah. And have you had an opportunity to reach out to him and and just have a discussion? Do you know him well? Yeah, I do. Um, I know him really well, obviously as a former teammate and he also lives here in Andorra and now obviously we have another uh, similarity in being out of a job for a s- small period of time. Um, and yeah, after the Nationals and as I was travelling to Europe, I actually sent Simon a message just asking for him to cri- like criticise my current situation to, to cri- see if I'm doing the right things. Um, Simon is more than happy to provide some pretty blunt reviews and uh which is awesome that's what you need um like in my situation everyone says like is positive positively supporting me uh but no one's actually looking at me critically and saying you should actually be doing this and simon uh provided an answer on things and gave me a bit of insight as to what i should do in a few months and then in a few months um but it was more or less a pretty uh, he, he said that my approach was the correct way of doing things and it's just you, know, you just have to come to Europe, be ready, stay fit, uh, stay fit. Uh, and, I mean, it's all very easy to say that. It's very complicated to do that. Um, but, yeah, as, I mean, Simon was without a job and I was riding with him in the Dandenongs and in December and he was talking about how he was going to have to finish his career he was going to have to get rid of his place in Andorra and all these things. And, you know, six months, seven months later, he's winning a stage of the Tour de France. It's, it's one of the best, it's one of the best Australian sporting stories that isn't widely known to be honest. Um, yeah. It's crazy. We said the exact same thing when, after that stage, we posted about it just saying that was one of the best Aussie wins you'll ever see. Um, it was just the, the story and emotion behind it was incredible. And one of the things that is so clear in your answers is uh, one, uh, just a lack of ego. It takes a lot of guts to be super open about your position because, as you've said, you know you're unemployed. You you you've only got a few months that you can make this work. Um, you have to be really open about it, which is really fucking tough. Like you have to, you know, be putting yourself on podcasts like this to try and get your name out there. And you're not saying "woe is me." You're not complaining. You're not you know putting any blame on EF about not getting a contract. You just said that's that's the way the game goes. You are getting a lot of support from back home. You know, there are media sites doing articles about you, really talking you up. Um, I know you've got a lot of support from other writers. You are looking for some uh, criticism, for example, like you just said from Simon Clark about where to improve. How are you balancing that mentally, um, knowing that you've got a lot of support behind you, but knowing that, you know, the situation isn't changing, waking up every day, forcing yourself to still train? Um, how are you balancing all that? Yeah, it's a really challenging situation. But the way I look at it is, if I want to find a solution to being a professional cyclist again, that this is what I have, this is the way that I have to ride for a bit. Um, and, uh, the stress of this situation 
uh, is something that I have to put up with in order to get my job back. And if I can't get my job back, I know that I'll be a better person for it. And whatever I end up doing later in life beyond cycling or whether I'm an athlete again in, in another space, I don't know. But I know that whatever I end up doing after this or if I end up keep doing this, that I will be, yeah, way better off for it um, in so many regards. So, um, yeah, to almost be in this situation is actually a non-issue because I know that I'm going to benefit regardless as to whether I find a solution or not. What a great attitude and uh, a lot of people can take a lot of um, uh, lessons from what you're saying and we don't appreciate what we've got until we've lost it and and you can say that about so many situations. If someone's injured, they just realize how passionate they are about the sport that they love doing, whether it's playing soccer or football or tennis or riding your bike. The minute it's taken away from you, you suddenly realize how much it means to you and and I hear that loud and clear you, you definitely have a passion and love for your chosen sport T- tell us about that and how how that's keeping you going yeah I mean obviously this job it it kind of fell onto my lap initially like it just it just happened and then all of a sudden I was living in Europe and I didn't have the appreciation for what I had I didn't truly understand yeah the situation I was in and I think actually with COVID uh, and with the financial stresses on the sport and even within the team that I realized that this opportunity is very fragile and it's, uh, yeah, it's a situation that uh, won't last forever. Um, So you have to appreciate when you have it. Um, Yeah. So, uh, so what what was the main crux of the question? Yeah, it's really, it's really how are you coping with the fact that you know it could be the end, and and yet you're you're so appreciative of the opportunities you've already had, and and the message to people is, you know, just understand how lucky you are for the position you're in because it can be taken away from you at any given time. Yeah, I mean, yeah, as you said, like uh, at the end of my EF contract when it wasn't renewed. Um, yeah, obviously when it's taken away from you, you really appreciate, yeah, what you had, I guess. Um, and yeah, I mean, that's when you just have to ask, when it's taken away from you, do you still want to do it? And is it your passion? And and it is my passion. Mm. Um, and I think it makes me a better person too. It's what, yeah, gets me up in the morning. Um, and I think I can inspire other people too. Um, and yeah, I'm lucky to have the support of a lot of people that enables me to to keep chipping away and keep uh, yeah, see if this if if this career can keep on ticking along. Yeah, I love that. I love that you are off here. We spoke about the Lockie Morton podcast, but um, that was one of our favorite conversations we've ever had. Um, and your ethos and your attitude about bike riding is so similar. And obviously, you were telling us you've spent a bit of time with him, and he's a bit of an inspiration. He's an inspiration to a lot of people, uh, and he's an inspiration to you, I'm sure. Um, and is that you know you spoke before about being able to get up in the morning and put your leg over your bike? Uh, is it that main love for the sport that is enables you to keep doing that and? To, to understand that, like you said, you're getting up and you're getting to ride around places people dream of. Um, you, you're thinking similar to Lockie in that way. Yeah, I mean, Lockie's podcast was the one you did with Lockie a few weeks ago. Was uh, quite incredible, actually. Um, and yeah, you guys really asked the right questions. And he's also someone that can express his thoughts incredibly well. Um, yeah, I think there's something about being a bike rider that where you have so much time to yourself, uh, mm, and that's you so have true. so much so much time to think about your situation, to think about the possibilities, to think about what you could be doing differently, or like could I be doing something different with my life that will give as much satisfaction? Um, and that's where, like he was saying that, like he was reflecting a lot on. Uh, yeah, why he was a bike rider and uh, yeah, being up here in the mountains in Andorra training by myself and really having a lot of time to myself. A lot of people might think, oh, that's uh, like in this situation when you want to be around heaps of people and be busy and these things, but actually you need to keep it simple uh, and yeah, have that time to think about 
yeah, what you, what you want to be doing with your life when you get to crossroads. I can imagine that once you get your contract back, the racing will be easy compared to what <laughs> you've been doing in the last period. And that will be an amazing experience in itself, I, th- I feel. What, what are your thoughts about that? I have definitely thought about the fact of, yeah, getting back on the start line. <laughs> um, yeah, it, it would be like uh, so satisfying. Um, my sense of appreciation and also my sense of like, you know how some athletes have like the, I don't know what it's called, like the animal in them, like the dog, like the, just that, yeah, that grit, yeah. that grit. Um, yeah, that white line fever. Like, yeah, exactly. I think I would have it in buckets compared to what I had before. Um, and mm-hmm. that would be, if I bring that across into some of the hardest bike racing in the world, then yeah. The resilience you're building, the resilience you're building in your, your personality and your character will will be an unbelievable advantage come racing. That's basically what I'm trying to say. The racing will not be any harder than, the, you know, the, the the roadblocks are being put in front of you right now you know you're still analytically working your way around them which is incredibly admirable and then come racing there'll be lots of challenges but they won't be nearly as hard as what you're doing now so i i just really take my hat off to you and, and we're super impressed with uh with with your resilience and uh the way you're going about it and um, you know, I'm a firm believer that you will prevail. I said that earlier, but uh, you know, the more you tell us, the the more I'm just desperate that uh, someone out there listening uh, can just you know take take uh, a little bit of a. It's not even a risk, you know. Get you on board and see what happens, and uh, I just can't wait for that moment. Um, I couldn't agree with Dad's sentiments more, and I know that um, words of affirmation and and us pumping you up doesn't you know mean mean much when you just want a contract you know everyone telling you how good a job you're doing you just you just want a contract is the main thing and we really grilled you about this situation at the moment um which is is tough to talk about and like i said it's so gutsy of you to um be sharing exactly what you're going through so we want to talk about you as an actual rider and where you're at now and the numbers that you're putting out now are unbelievable obviously the best thing you could do is is race results which you've tried to do in in every situation possible the local races nationals this year um but let's talk about your actual ability as a rider right now and uh, physiologically, um, some of your power numbers that you were speaking about uh, on video last week, can you take us through um, it's kind of some of the numbers you're hitting at the moment and what are you, are you trying to improve them? Is that your goal? If, can you do you know 20 minute tests every every so often to try and show teams that you're um, improving those numbers, improving those power numbers? What's what's your goal around them? But so sorry, two part question. Start with kind of going through your current ability and power numbers, and then what you're trying to do with that. Yeah, I mean, uh, if you look at my power data uh, throughout the last, yeah, four years, um, my my raw power, so like the power PBs itself, haven't actually gone up too much uh, from when I was uh, as a domestic rider. But my, I mean, uh, this is quite common within uh, domestic riders versus world tour riders, is that it's their resistance fatigue that is exceptional. And that's what really is a different di- differential between yeah uh, for example a aussie amateur at a high level in the nrs versus a world tour rider um so that's something that has really improved on my end is just my ability to produce for example 95 percent of my 20 minute power pv after 3500 kjs um so yeah, and this can be easily shown within Training Peaks, which is the platform that I use anyway. Um, and yeah, and yeah, World Tour teams see this. And whenever a World Tour uh, coach or a Pro Tour coach looks at my stuff, they they are they always give the tick of approval. Um, and there was actually one one team uh, that said my numbers weren't good enough, but. I perhaps showed that otherwise against them at the nationals, and there was three riders <laughs> of that team at nationals. So, yeah. Anyway, we'll get into that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, that's, I like that you said that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, from from a power perspective, uh, it's yeah. I mean, obviously, I have good numbers, and then it's obviously all relative to your weight too. And I'm quite a light guy, so that's to my favour. Um, and 
Yeah. What was the second part of the question? Are you aiming to improve that now? I mean, you kind of answered it in saying that the goal is to show yeah. that um, that resistance to fatigue, but what are you kind of aiming for now? Yeah. So, I mean, now I just have to, every now and then when I go down, train lower down at sea level, I'll do some power testing just to reiterate the fact that if a coach is still looking at my stuff that I can uh, very obviously show that I'm physically fit and that I'm doing the power numbers required for a bike race. It's a... Uh... It's kind of a ironic situation when you first got your contract, how raw you were, and you probably didn't have that endurance ability to absorb such huge loads that that now you're you're, and also you didn't have the race craft, um, the technical skills. They're all things you have now. You you still have the same power or better power, raw power than you did when you first got the contract. You now are. A, a way better skillful tactician. You you actually can technically climb and descend as well as any world tour rider. You've got all these things that that should seemingly get you the contract you you need. Yet because it was that one event that that turned everything. Is there is there something? And I know the the Australian road title was one of those events that you that you were aiming to get that jersey for and probably would have been a bit of a game changer for you is there something you could have that you can do in the future that's that's imminent that can get you an opportunity to show how good you are um, in a in a race situation um, we know we've talked about the communication and the relationship building which is which is unbelievably important but is there one standout thing and I know it's no good talking backwards about what happened in January. Your performance was outstanding. You were at the front of the race. You were possibly the best rider and the fittest rider there, but didn't quite get the finish that you wanted. Is Yeah, take us through all that thought process and how – is there anything you can do on the track that can that put you in front of people again? Yeah, I've been thinking about this and uh, it's it's difficult to – provide an answer to this i mean i mean the only thing that i can do is like i don't have access to the big races because i'm not a contracted rider um and yeah i can do all the power testing and all the numbers that reiterate the power that i've already done which is not the question here um so i think uh i just need to if i get a chance to do these local spanish races and try and win one of those and that's something and that's about the the only noise that i can create right now um uh yeah there's i don't think there's a question as to whether i'm i think if, if yeah within the world tour managers and pro tour managers the there's not a question as to whether i'm good enough uh, it's just whether the opportunity is there and if they're willing to give that to me or to someone else um is that so yeah does that make it easier mentally knowing that you are good enough and give you confidence or just waiting for the opportunity is frustrating but at least you have the confidence that you you're good enough it, it is it is frustrating because uh i'm kind of stuck in limbo in a way uh in the australian summer i had that australian nationals to chase i had something tangible to work towards and and as you saw on the nationals i was stupidly aggressive uh i mean in the in, in the podcast with lucas hamilton lucas was talking about how he regrets being aggressive in the race he must look at my bike race and think far out. <laughs> jimmy was so stupid that day tactically but i just had to show show my legs that day and i knew i had amazing legs and i could have um sat in that second group all day and then finished seventh, but no one would be talking about me because I was never relevant in the bike race. Um, anyway, that's a different uh, topic, but um, it is frustrating not to have, yeah, like a tangible race where I know that, uh, you know, there'll be some pro teams at this race that I can do where I will beat their riders and a manager will be watching. Um, so from it is, yeah, I am, as I said, stuck in limbo but i just have to keep doing the controllables and then hoping that uh yeah uh a manager comes in contact again with with at the right time uh and there is an opportunity there um and i mean if you crunch the numbers it's unlikely um but there's actually nothing else i can do do you want to ask one more question on, on the nationals dad and i were talking about it um yeah and whether 
yeah, I mean, I know you said you don't regret the way you raced um, and you regretted it then that you wanted to sh- show yourself at the front. Um, but uh, in hindsight, if you, you know, you, you are very strong, would you have tried to back yourself in um, to think that if you had stayed in the um, second group in the main bunch and the race came back together, um, you could have given yourself better than a top seven finish um, against some of the strongest guys, you know, in the country, in the world. Um, yeah, was there anything you would have done differently thinking from that perspective? Yeah, I mean, it's all hindsight. But uh, yeah. I knew on that day, like, I was really fit. Uh, um, and I'd done a lot of training, a lot of heat work. And I knew at that bike race that I could use a lot of bullets and still be at the front of the race for that final lap. And I could take all the chances during the race to be at the front of the race. And maybe that was one of the moves. Um, Like there was a lot of discussion about uh, the world tour guys being super experienced and not showing their, their legs until the last few laps. And I think a lot of that is tactical now, but also they didn't have a choice. They were still early in the preseason preparations and they only had two bullets they could fire whereas I had 10. Um, so from that perspective, um, my race was quite different to theirs. Um, if I had have known, if I had have known uh, that Green Edge were going to go so all in for Bling, I would have just stayed with Bling. Um, I thought that they would maybe uh, put a few more riders up the road or into moves as opposed to riding the front and bringing bling to the front of the race. Um, and that's when I could run my chance of racing with those guys that go out the road and then try and beat them. That was my chance. To, that was my theory anyway. And it didn't pan out like that. Um, and it would have been nice to be in that front group of five or uh, four in the end coming to the finish. Yeah. But uh, I just yeah. Yeah, faded in through the uni on the last lap. Everything's hindsight. Right. Did yeah. you have another question on that, Dad? No, I, I, that explains it to me now and I really like that answer and um, I actually I actually agree with you. Um, I think I think what you did was the right tactical move because that could have paid off in most bike races. That probably would have played off except you had one team determined to make it the complete opposite and they had the numbers. So... Um, so I think I think your tactics were were absolutely fantastic and spot on, and and in, in any other situation it probably would have panned out in your favour. Um, yeah, so look, we, we, we're super appreciative of, of your time. I don't know, Joy, if you've got. Um, well, I'm sorry to take so much of your time. Um, you probably need to get out and train, but um, I rest out today. Yeah, so <laughs> <laughs> rest day exactly killing time is uh, yeah, exactly right. it's all about inefficiency <laughs> yep. on a rest day when I'm not working still so <laughs> yeah, yeah true I wanted to finish up. one more question on the nationals I mean you definitely made some noise in the Australian scene because everyone saw how that race unfolded did you uh, did it result in any any um any kind of conversation that you saw um from worldwide from other teams did you um did you um agent um, Baden Cook, have any communication with anyone after the race, um, or nothing direct? Yeah, there was. It was looking really good at one point. Um, yeah, it was again frustrating because I had six World Tour teams who were all in touch with with Baden, um, and yeah, they would have a look at my stuff. Uh, the coaches would give the tick of approval, and then that would go to the management, and then the manager would make a decision. Uh, and then for whatever reason, uh, whether it was a timing thing, uh, whether they just weren't interested in the end, like it only takes one person to say a firm no within the the five of the management and then that's that. Um, so yeah, there were, uh, there were a few bites and I was keeping my fingers crossed that I'd be getting on a f- flight. Yeah. After the, yeah, after the Australian summer that I would find myself a job. Um, and it just didn't form out the way I wanted it to. So, so that probably yeah. shows that you rode the, the right way then with the fact that you had so many conversations after that, that probably affirms um, how well you raced, right? Yeah. Um, and the good thing about this year's nationals is that there were a lot of world-class bike riders. Um, la- last year's nationals, um, when I came second, uh, the main criticism uh, from and also from the Santos Festival of Cycling is that European managers would question the 
credibility of the race from just because there weren't that many world tour guys there. Uh, whereas this this year there were um, almost all the Australian pros went back for the nationals. So yeah, they couldn't it dispute this this year. Exactly, it was one of the most stacked races we've had in a while. Uh, yeah. Well, we'll finish off here. I did a uh, final question I want to ask is again we've kind of really hammered you about your situation right now, and and um, it's pretty. Uh, good of you to you know, talk so openly about um, all the struggles of it which is really tough do you find it um hard to talk about do you find it um just something that you have to do because it wasn't something you signed up for as a professional athlete to have to also be good at fighting for your job um, you just want to be able to get on the bike and train how do you see this kind of situation we're at now yeah uh, as you were saying before a lot of people wouldn't be so open about it because um like uh, a lot of people wouldn't share the f- when they're unemployed for example you know um yeah so if, you just have to put your ego away um and you have to understand that uh talking about your situation is going to create a bit of noise and people talking and it's a small world um and i think i'm able to communicate my feelings and my situation well enough that yeah i don't sound like i'm singing a sob story um and also, another thing that's important that, like, uh, I think uh, athletes are inspirational when they do good performances, but they're also perhaps even more inspirational when shit hits the fan. Um, and I think uh, more, to be honest, I think I'm, uh, my story is better now than if I had won a Juro stage, for example. Like, it, obviously, <laughs> it's very different, but... Yeah, um, I think a lot of people can take away from it, and um, I'm not doing much else for anyone at the moment. I'm not really doing good for anyone at the moment. So if I can at least share my situation and provide some inspiration, then that's something that's that's good. And then obviously, as I said, it will create people talking about me, and uh, yeah, uh, it's 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 good. So no, I, I yeah, I just I was just really appreciative, mate, and. Uh, I- we just wish you luck with uh, – and we can't wait to see what happens next and, and there's going to be a good end to this story. Um, I feel it and I've had a lot of years under my belt to see things and, you just, you know, no one deserves anything in this world. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, um, if you keep putting yourself out there, you keep being consistent and, you, you've, you know, you're showing vulnerability, you're showing that you're – that you're, you know, a team member, and you're willing to do whatever it takes to to, to do the passion that that you want so much as to ride your bike uh, and show show the talents you have. Um, I think you will prevail. So, uh, yeah, I just want to I just want to say congratulations, mate. And no matter what happens, um, you are an inspiration to a lot of people who are listening. And and if if we can be half as resilient as you are, we'll have some decent uh, experiences in our life. So I will really thank you so much for coming on and. Uh, and sharing your story and we hope the story has a really good ending and uh, look forward to uh, following your your journey and uh, if there's any way we can help uh, you know don't hesitate to yell out because we're, we're right behind you no cheers yeah thanks for yeah providing conversation and yeah cheers for being able to share yeah my situation with on your platform you guys do a really neat job of um, sharing insight into yeah athletes lives on and off the the field so yeah cheers really appreciate it and i yeah i'll reiterate what dad said Uh, and for the listeners i know that everyone will love it um love this podcast love this episode specifically um but i will say you know off air um you were really congruent and um in saying that it's it's not about you having a sob story or anything you didn't say these words but this is what um we gathered from you directly is that yeah you're not you're not trying to shout a sob story or anything This, this is the real realistic situation of where you're at um, we reached out to you and said, we, you know, we'd love to um, for you to tell your story. You're super open about it. Um, and so, you never know who's listening, but if there's any, anyone listening that uh, could help in any way, um, get this man a contract because uh, this story is pretty epic and we really hope it has a good ending. So, once again, Jimmy, thank you very much for joining us. And to everyone listening, we hope you enjoyed the episode. Thank you for listening to another one and we'll see you on the next one. Mm-hmm.